Thanks for listening to the Doonstie Audio Fiction Magazine. See you guys later. I'm going for a smoke break. <laughs> yeah, I'll get it done. Thanks for listening to the Doonstie Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield. It's so bright and vivid. And Big Anklevich. And boom goes the dynamite. Hi. Welcome. This is the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And the volume number. Saying the There's no volume number. Come on. It was all you're doing. Wait, no, it was Optimus Prime's doing. That's why we don't say that anymore. It is episode 83. Today's story. And what is that story, Wait, Big you're... Anklevich? The story is called After We Got Back the Lights by Eric Del Carlo. Eric Del Carlo's short science fiction, fantasy, and horror have appeared in Futurismic, Tailbones, Necrotic Tissue, and many, <laughs> and many other publications. He is co-author with the late Robert Asprin of the war-torn fantasy novels. He has written a final book with Asprin and Teresa Patterson, a French Quarter murder mystery entitled No Quarter published by Dark Star Books. For more about Eric Del Carlo, check out the link in the show notes. We'd also like to thank Josh Roseman, Juliet Bowler, and Rich Girardi for lending their voices to today's episode. Today's music was by Augen Stilchen. Check out the links in the show notes. <laughs> After We Got Back the Lights, by Eric Del Carlo. Rust wept from bullet holes in the driver's door of the Contra Costa Sheriff's car. Rooftop rollers wove red and blue, but the siren wasn't going, which would have brought everybody down to the weedy strip of Highway 29 which I didn't want. I had the butt of an autoloader planted on my hip, set to drop into an aggressive posture. Especially if this guy, going to a masquerade as an old-time law enforcement official, made a move for the sidearm strapping his thigh. He had a haircut, a crisp shirt, but for footwear, he sported hiking boots patched with electrical tape. Shuck, I said. The lawman shook his head, topped with a crumpled straw something that was probably supposed to suggest official headgear. He stooped into his cruiser. Justin Cushenberry, at my left, and also armed, twitched. But I waved him cool with my free hand, and the lawman merely cut the engine. I had nearly forgotten what an engine, internally combusting, sounded like. And it had wholly slipped my mind or I'd never noticed back then, what a live automobile smelled like. Especially on a fine late spring day with the crickets lively in the highway's weeds. The hypnotic roof light stopped. It's all true, said the law. Indulgent disdain moved the bristles of my beard. I'm not a hard ass, and I don't have aggressions to work out. That's in part why this town has kept me doing what I do all these years. So I didn't tell this guy he was full of shit, that I'd heard stories like his before. I simply quietly told him to get back in his machine and turn it around. He got exasperated for a minute. I flexed my fingers on the shotgun. Shaking his straw-hatted head again, he climbed into the aged vehicle. It was a sight heading back south like a motorized memory that had gotten loose from the past. Did you see his badge? Justin Cushenberry wanted to know. It was... shiny. I wasn't unaffected. As shucks went, it had been a good one. We turned away from the highway. After that, a canvasback olive drabber growled its way right through, up 29, which is Main Street, inside the town's limits. The big army truck went north, toward Calistoga. A lot of people saw it, and everybody talked about it. 
I kept mum because I'm not eager to dispense my opinions. Even-handed. If I get described, that's in there. It's a good trait to have. The best, in fact, for my job. But I did get asked directly, because I was respected. I said, let's wait and see. It was always a small town. Not insular and not poor. Not by a long shot, back when money was a measurement. Those who stayed and those who survived turned out to be decent people. Maybe I was surprised at just how decent, or how capable, or how willing to dig in and do what work needed doing. Maybe most surprised by how cooperative we all were with each other. In another era, this would have been a quaint, hippy-dippy social experiment. It wasn't. It was our town. And we'd kept it alive through these years. I saw no reason to give up our autonomy to anyone who could put together a passable mock-up of a cop car or a military deuce and a half. But after that, about a week later, a helicopter went overhead, then came back, or it was a different one, and circled the town for 20 minutes. Either these were raiders with access to fuel and technological riches, or else the country was pulling itself back together. And we were going to be citizens of something greater than our township once again. After that, well, they came in gentle but firm force, but in better vehicles, not just one scraped together like that first sheriff's cruiser. And they had better equipment, and snappy uniforms, and calming authoritativeness. They also had goodies. Bars of soap, MREs, socks, iodine, condoms. Lots of supplies. Or at least what seemed like an abundance to us who'd had no new manufactured goods for so long. It was no shuck, no raider's ruse to get us to let down our guard. I had long since admitted that. There was celebrating. The town whooped it up. My family jubilated. I reveled because it felt like my share to do. Census takers came. I was asked questions along with everyone else, cautious of the inquiries I was silently waiting on, the crucial questions, the dangerous ones. What did you do to survive? And maybe more luridly and to the point, how far did it go? I waited, and no one asked. Indeed, I would have been the one to ask, and I already knew the answers. Two and a half months later, with the town circumscribed by a witch's circle of engineers and firefighters, they poured electrical power back into our local grid. No fires were started, and bright, civilized light radiated and streamed. Everyone wept. Every last one of us. I knew it was over, really all over, when they issued us money. Newly minted bills, gold in color, prettily designed, without any Masonic bullshit. Everybody had an even start. It was like a Monopoly game set to commence. And for me, it felt about as real. But I went along. 29 was being repaved, and people gathered and cheered at the new black steaming borders of Main Street. Gasoline was at the gas station again. I'd preserved in the garage the tires off our Ford Explorer. Now, lug nutted them back on, filled the tank. It was like wrangling a stoned bull. I could barely drive it. Emmy, who'd always loved the vehicle, took right to it as if she'd been driving only last week. There were military all over, going north and south, not all battle-strapped, most, in fact, part of the non-aggressive units of Operation Reconstitution. That was the name, Reconstitution. Somebody put an iota of thought into that descriptive and patriotism-inducing codename. Personnel stopped in our town, friendly in a clipped sir, ma'am way. One I tried to get chit-chatting told me there would be a presidential election in November. Though I pointed out it was an off year, 
The people need to put someone in the White House, the soldier said. Who's there now? But what I wondered was, had anybody been there these last years, anybody at all? When the power grid went out, when all the things had come apart back then, we'd lost all national awareness. We were just this town and nothing more, or less. The exchange ended with a grave, You folks are better off than some. Which had to be the official sign-off. I heard it so often. When the Safeway reopened, Emmy and I and all the kids went. I walked the aisles like a zombie, and I wasn't the only one. I bumped, literally, into Roberto Canis, who, quiver-lipped, was clutching two differently labeled cans of tomato soup. For something like five minutes, I stared at a steak through its cellophane wrap, until Mike, my boy, came scampering up, imparting all sorts of news about all the great stuff here. Later, I ate that steak. I was so used to deer and squirrel, I didn't know what to make of it. Emmy drove us and the groceries home. I sat quietly, hands folded. We had officially appointed police in the town now. They had two patrol cars. They introduced themselves to everyone. They made no particular fuss over me. One night, I jolted awake. Hard enough, I practically bounced Emmy off the far side of the bed. But she sleeps deep and well. Around me, the house was humming. It felt like a dynamo, lightning waiting inside every wall socket. I could hear the refrigerator cycling in the kitchen. The wilderness quiet of the night was gone. I went half-dressed into the living room to pull on my boots. I'd refused to give them up, despite the worn to wafer soles, though I had accepted new laces for them. I sat a moment more on the couch, telling myself to just stay there. I was shaking, pent up. When I slipped out the front door, my heart was pounding. California summer night, no jacket required. Street lamps bleared their light. Across the way, a raccoon was sitting under one, gazing up, bandit-eyed and perplexed. I started up the street, slow, unsteady steps. I had asked another soldier what they were calling it, how the history books would record it. The collapse? The crash? The American Dark Ages? All sounded kind of science fiction-y to me. She said, The hard years, officially. The hard years. I'd smirked at her, officially. But then, I had asked. I guess they could have come up with a worse, or at least more overwrought, name for what had happened. I ranged out into the warm electrical night, startled by shadows that moon or starlight never would have created. I passed houses I knew, knew everyone who lived in them. But soon, new people would come, people returning and relocating. A few insomniac windows were lit, but I saw nobody else out. When I came to the lane that cut between two vineyards, I turned down it. Wineries can grow more than grapes, which we found out early on, laying in every comestible crop we could. It was one reason I'd gazed around nonplussed, passing through the Safeway's produce department. Our local fields are Napa County fertile. Not that we'd given up viticulture altogether. Wine was a good trade commodity. Some smart cookie had even thought to put in some pot. Farther along, the dark became more authentic. I had been the one people had looked to, not for sage advice, but when there was trouble. I could face it, handle it. Now, who was I? The lane emptied into a wild lot where poppies grew. Away from the streets, here I stopped, feeling the thumping of my heart ease. I knew where I was, of course. Knew the tall redwood that was the only tree here. This wasn't a restful place. But I felt a calming nonetheless. A sure reminder of my past purpose. I stared and stared at that tree. So long and so intently, in fact, that I didn't immediately register the person who stepped around from behind the thick trunk. Corey. Which gave me a new hard jolt that woke me right out of my reverie. The figure was dressed in earth tones. I peered at him through the night. 
The masculine voice had spoken my name as a wary, neutral greeting. The sort of hail we'd all give each other at a morning sales meeting at the car dealership where I used to work. That's right. I was never a certified cop. Our police fled when the shit came down. Responding in kind, I said, Miles. Miles Nordham. Here. Standing beneath this tree. Not here by accident, any more than I was. Great, terrible, unsaid things hung in the air. Or so it felt. I stood five paces off. Miles leaned back against the redwood. He wore a mud-colored poncho and jeans faded gray. His hair was long, almost white. I squinted for his expression. I hardly know you without the whiskers, Miles said. It seemed a casual statement, maybe friendly. I was careful to give no tension to my voice. Promised Emmy I'd shave if I could ever use my Norelco again. It still felt as though a pair of icy angel's hands was cupping my face. I missed my bristly gray, even if I did look five years younger, like Emmy said. Deal's a deal. Miles' shoulders shrugged a poncho. His hands hung in the pockets. Yes, it is, I agreed. How is Emmy? Even more casual now. Two long-time acquaintances shooting the breeze. She's fine. Then, though true, the statement was too trite, and I said with sincerity, She's a rock. Miles nodded with slow, genuine understanding. I should reciprocate. He'd asked after my wife. I ought to make a polite inquiry about his. Well, there was the rub. Olivia Schultes was still married to Jimmy Schultes, and we hadn't had a priest or a bureaucrat who could undo it. That hadn't mattered during these past years. But now? Screw it, I asked. How's Olivia doing? The shrug came again, with a whispering of nylon. This time, Miles grunted a half chuckle. <laughs> it's like the lights went out a month ago, and now they're back on. No, not quite like that. But she's accepting it. Adjusting. We were still two men standing out in a lonely dim field in the small hours of the night, when nobody should be here at all. Not here. And certainly not either one of us. My eyes were straying past Miles to the dark rising column of the tree. I almost let my head tilt back, my gaze rove upward to that high, brawny branch. But he spoke again, and again it was chew the fat, down homeness. How's the lungs these days? And I told him. How's your back? And he told me. Two years ago, I'd had what might have been pneumonia. Miles suffered from lower back trouble, maybe arthritic. Our doctor had been a vet from the local no-kill animal shelter. A good fellow, though. Once our diabetics and the old folks who needed cardiac pills died off, our mortality rate, even for infants, was actually about what it had been in the old days. Half of Dr. Kimura's house had burned down one autumn. We cut and salvaged timber and built him a bigger place. No zoning crap to slow things up. Took the town two and a half weeks. Miles, I remembered, did a lot of sanding, since he couldn't handle anything too strenuous. A lull came to our out-of-place tete-a-tete. I could see Miles' features a bit better, aided by the distant spill of streetlights. His brows kept pulling down and together, like he was listening to some internal rhythm. And I didn't know how to break the pause, how to excuse myself the hell away from here. Finally, he asked, How are Mike and Zoe? The inflection was just a little off. His hands were still slung in the poncho's pockets. It was, really, one question too many. One past where we could safely pretend to be just conversing. And I didn't like the question, which would have been innocuous coming from anybody but Miles Nordham. The shakiness of earlier was trying to come back. I felt each beat of my heart. I had faced down serious danger over the past several years. I had kept this town safe. Had all that just vanished with the lights coming back on? 
I decided I would answer, even though I couldn't, most certainly could not, ask him back this same question. Can't get Mike away from the TV. Zoe wants to go to Seattle. <laughs> Miles's chuckle was fuller this time, but it still had a queer, off-key sound to it. Did you tell her it rains there all the time? Actually, I had. But Seattle, as exotic and far away as any destination ever was, had captured my daughter's imagination. She was 16 and remembered what travel used to be like. I didn't doubt she would go eventually. I knew she wouldn't want to go back to school. She remembered that too well. We had handled education in an informal and effective manner in the town. Most everybody pitched in whenever there was time. Miles had read to the kids from his archaeology texts. I didn't respond to his comment. I was staring at him. He started to shrug again. Then his right hand came out of the poncho, and in it was a pistol, almost toy-sized, old and dull gray metal, a stumpy butt. And now the pretense was over, and I understood the other reason he was here at this tree. I kept the trembling out of my voice as I asked, How long have you been waiting for me? His eyebrows were moving again, and I didn't like how fidgety he was getting. How long since Matthew died? He countered, the question going hoarse and frail halfway through. Died, I damn well knew, wasn't the word. Neither did Miles need his question answered. He could tell me to the day. He went on. I used to come out here every night. I didn't sleep for a year after Matthew. Now I just come when I miss him too much. When I can't take it. Matthew Nordham, young, jet dark hair, good looking, wiry and energetic. I had sensed something of the sociopath in him, even when he was a teen. One night he had climbed through a window into Charlene Carbo's bedroom and raped her. Two witnesses saw him coming back out, and of course there was Charlene's testimony. I caught Matthew hiding on a roof and locked him in an old walk-in freezer. Four days later, after other people had made serious decisions, I noosed a rope around his neck, and he died hanging from this tree, from that high branch. Miles was trembling out right now, not concealing it like I was. His sparkling eyes caught the far-off street lamps. What? His voice was ragged and raw. A final crisis was approaching, a last turning point. What if he'd been yours? What if it was Mike? The dull gray barrel of the pistol shook. I said very quietly, What if the girl had been Zoe? And even saying it, giving the idea even that much reality, set ominous instincts in motion within me. But I held steady. He reached out, and I saw his finger wasn't on the trigger. I strode forward, and he dumped the pistol in my hand. Tears were rolling down his cheeks as he said, I didn't hand it in. Back when you first took the job, you told everybody left in town to turn in all firearms so we could have a pool. But I kept this old thing. I weighed it in my hand. It wasn't much, but it was real and it had no doubt kept Miles company on many nights standing in ambush under this tree. I walked him back to his place. He bade me good night. Then I went home too, steps quicker and steadier than before. Months later, when things were getting seriously organized and workers were out painting fresh crosswalks and, God help us, there was a mayoral campaign on, a crew with a cherry picker and chainsaw lopped the top off that lone redwood. It had overgrown and was now interfering with a power line that transversed the two vineyards. That night, Miles and I went there, found the big branch that had once overhung the poppy rife lot, and chopped it up for firewood. He took home one half of the wood, and I carried off the other.
Author's Note. Hello, this is Eric Del Carlo, and I wrote After We Got Back the Lights, which was published in Strange Horizons magazine. The story essentially is a reversal on a familiar science fiction tale. The government has collapsed, and now, after a period of a few years, it's reasserting itself. Society is coming back. That's an upbeat story. But I wondered, what if it's not such good news for everybody? Not for, say, barbaric people who might have profited during a time of chaos, but rather those who had kept the peace in lieu of any official authority. In particular, one man, the character in this story, who served as the de facto sheriff in his small town, and who now must relinquish that authority. How does he feel about that? What does that do to a man? That's what I asked myself as a writer, and I answered that question with this story. And now, a word from the author. This story has everything. People, furniture, talking. It's a real American story. And you're back in the room. We're back. So I hope you guys enjoyed that story. I did. That's why I chose it. Well, where did you hear the story, and why did you choose it, and was it difficult to get it for the show? In three words or less. Um, I was reading stories over on Strange Horizons. I like to do that because Strange Horizons has great stories. And, you know, I just go over there and check them out. It's a crazy tick of mine. And I was reading there one day and I came across this story. And, man, I just really enjoyed it. There was something about it that really captured my interest. I thought, you know what, we we got to see if if Eric Del Carlo would be interested in having us do the story on the show. So I sent him an email, and he was down with it. That happens fairly often, I guess, as long as you aren't trying to get somebody really famous like Cory Doctorow. Oh, wait! We got a Cory Doctorow story. Oh, have you ever had somebody say, no, I don't want my story podcast? Well, that has happened once or twice. How is it the money? Because we're I, it, not able to pay a lot? Or is it just, hey, no. The one time that somebody said no to me, I think it was only one time, I can't think of another time, but he said, you know, i really like to let you have this story, but I use the money that I get from selling these short stories to pay for groceries and things like that, so I can't really give it away at the price that you guys are able to pay, unfortunately, and so, and, yeah. And three months later, it was on Starship Sofa. Pays, wow. Who pays nothing? Did Mrs. Outfield ever have any children that lived? I become over oversensitized, the opposite of desensitized, oversensitive that somebody's going to think that that's a, an insult towards Starship Sofa. But you know, God, please don't be offended just to be offended, you piece of crap. No, oh, this is much better. Uh, and and you know, I guess there are, there are different reasons why somebody wouldn't want their story podcasted or podcast. I think it's just podcast. I, I like know. podcast better than podcasted because it just, you know, the past tense of cast to cast a, a part or to cast a fishing pole is cast. Uh huh. So we'll, we'll just say from now on that it's podcast. Yeah, dang it. We're in charge. But, but broadcast past tense is broadcasted. What does all this have to do with anything? Yeah, and podcast is just a straight up ripoff of broadcast, so. Shoot. Um, okay, who's the know it all that always corrects us? And, and I can't remember your name. I'll thank you when later you let us know whether it's podcasted or podcast. And we'll start saying it that way. You have the power. There we go. Power to the people. So so I like I was saying, I can, I can see a couple of different factors. You know, maybe they don't like us. Zing! Maybe they're from a different continent and they don't want our accents selling okay. their story. I can imagine that there are people that just prefer it to be on the page uh -huh. or in pixels, I guess, in Stretch Horizon's <laughs> case. I had a conversation with my friend who believes that if you've listened to an audiobook, you've not actually read the book. If you, know, if you heard a short story podcast on one of those great podcasts, then you haven't actually read it. And, and I couldn't disagree anymore if he told me that Kesha's voice is melodious and, and, and she's just overflowing with talent. But, uh, you know, I guess there are people that, that feel that way. 
Have you heard anybody say that before? It's like, oh, yeah, I read Time Traveler's Life. And they're like, but did you read it or did you listen to it? I don't think I've ever had anybody say that to me. Sometimes I feel like I need to quantify it to other people, though. Sometimes I'm just like, oh, yeah, I read that book. Well, I didn't actually read it. I listened to it. But kind of, I don't know why I do that. Well, for me, sometimes it requires just as much concentration to follow an audiobook because mm-hmm. you'll just be driving and you'll miss your stop or, or you know somebody almost cuts you off and three minutes later you realize hey, i haven't heard anything that they've been <laughs> right. saying i got to go back and pay closer attention or somebody says something and you're like oh shoot i need to focus my ears a little bit more on what i'm i'm hearing so that i can understand yeah i've done that plenty where i'm driving and, uh, and for some reason my mind starts thinking about something else and it's just going and going and, but i do the same thing when i'm reading books sometimes too. Yeah, everybody does except your for your mind just moves off into a different direction and you realize oh crap i gotta turn like uh, two three how many pages do i have to turn back really so your eyes continue to go over the page yeah, you see mine tend reading. to go over the same sentence over and over and uh, over yeah. again when my brain has checked out so usually i realize oh whoops the yeah. train has left the tracks okay so eric del carlo how did you contact this guy Oh, you can find anybody's email address if you've got a Google. Oh, okay. That's all it really takes these days, it seems. At least somebody who wants to be known, like an author, will have a tendency to have a page with the contact information. It's pretty simple, usually, if you want to contact somebody these days. You don't even have to look up their address and send them mail out like you used to have to to be a fan. But yeah, I just sent him an email and he said, yeah, that that sounds great. Go ahead and, and go for it. And... There you go. Okay. Now, as far as this story goes, I'm assuming that this isn't part of a greater work. This is just a short story, and we're not really meant to know what happened before the story began. Am am I correct in assuming that? That's what I assume, too. I don't know the author's full canon, but I don't think so. That was one of the things that I liked best about it, that it was after the hard years it is everything's coming back and it's the things that they remember from years before some people may know because i've blogged about it within the last year i've been on a diet a few times and this is a smaller version of what these people i'm sure went through but when you're on a diet you're restricted to what you can eat you're only allowed to eat this or that my diet had like no sugar was allowed no carbohydrates were allowed etc You know, and then when you finally are able to come off of it, you have to come back off of it slowly so you can start eating more calories, but you still can't have sugar and carbohydrates. And then, oh, you can slowly work in the carbs, etc. And it's kind of like this life that these people must have led. You know, suddenly all the things that they took for granted were snatched away from them. They all just crumbled and went away. They had no power. They had no grocery stores anymore they had to suddenly start growing their own food they probably ate out of cans for a long time until they were able to produce something and they grew their own food and suddenly like the world just went back a hundred years and their iphones and all that crap stopped working and they just had to live without it i'm assuming these people probably expected to always have to just live without it at you know once it's gone for years You don't expect some army truck to roll into town and them to put up new wires and all of a sudden, hey, there's the streetlights again. But it turned out that they were on a diet. They were just on a diet from modern society for a while. And then suddenly it's all coming back. And I absolutely loved the part, the part that just, I don't know what it was about it that hit me. But when they were standing there in the grocery store and they're looking and they've got like two cans of lima beans or whatever the freak. I don't remember what kind of can it was that he had in his hand, but he was just looking at the two different things and just crying, weeping. But these things had come back finally to his life. That was just a moving thing to me for some reason. Maybe I just love food too much. No, I, I can't <laughs> wait for the description of this episode when I'll say, plus Big Anklevich compares dieting to nuclear holocaust. <laughs> there you go. You can make a comparison from one thing to another no matter what. And yeah, I do remember during those hard years, those hard months when you were dieting this year, uh, we would get together for our traditional uh, pre-podcasting meal. And yeah, you just couldn't eat. That was it. It's like, oh, no, no, I'll watch you eat. (laughs) What's that sound? 
Nothing, nothing, nothing. <laughs> Has somebody read the Necronomicon around here? What is that noise? And it's uh, the uh, when, alien being that when, is housed in my uh, lower intestine. Yeah, making that noise now. And when finally, you know, my, my diet phase six or whatever hits <laughs> next weekend, we can go to Wendy's or something like that. And you were just so looking forward to that and so happy that, yeah, you, you practically were crying when you were able to just <laughs> order what you wanted it, off the menu. You know, it's kind of amazing you i don't know if you've done a full-on diet like that or if you've just like oh i need to lose weight so i'm gonna eat more healthy and so you try and eat more healthy but doing a, a diet i'd never done this before this year this is just not something i'd ever considered and maybe that was why i was almost 300 pounds but and now it's time it was, for a very special episode of blossom I, you know because you're just prohibited to do these things you know i mean you can do them it's not like the police are going to arrest you or something like that but it's going to ruin the whole point of doing the diet in the first place when you start gaining weight instead of losing it lunchy munchy hmm? But it's really, you know, you wouldn't believe, A, how often opportunities come up for you to eat cake or drink soda or have a cookie, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we did that for like four weeks. How m many times, you, you know, it's, I swear it's every day. And I am not, as I said, I was almost 300 pounds, not one of those people that just, Says, oh no, I'm fine. Let me turn that down. I'm one of those persons <laughs> that always takes part in one of those things. For me to turn that thing down, you look at it so wistfully and you're just like, oh. And you go to somebody's house like, hey, who wants a cookie? And be like, I do so, so bad want a cookie. You want some more cheesy poofs, huh? Yeah, I want a cheesy poof. It was a, a difficult thing for me. I was never somebody who exerted any self-control in my life, especially when it came to food. So just a completely different thing. And now in the case of these people in their nuclear holocaust, which we have no idea exactly really what happened. Maybe it was the uh, super flu or maybe it was something else. Who knows? But uh, these people didn't have the opportunity to have those things anymore. And once they were gone, they were gone because nobody was out there making more Cheetos in the Cheetos factory. Yeah, gosh, that would be hard. And I think that would be obviously a hundred times harder than a diet because a diet's for a couple weeks. It's a short-term thing. And then when it's over, you can sort of go back to living the way you were before. Of course, if you want to keep the weight off, you don't want to go completely back to the way you were before. But... You know, you can go back and you can eat that sugar sometimes. But these poor people, you know, you didn't. And then when all of a sudden it turns out that that wasn't the case. It really was just a diet. They were only on it for a short period of time and it was over. And the tears that they wept was, I don't know, it just I really liked that part. I assume there are other things you could compare it to if you were ever living overseas on a student exchange program or you were visiting a third world country for right. the Peace Corps or you were in prison. These are all things that when they end, suddenly everything tastes better. Suddenly you're just blown away. It's like, holy cow, there are barbecued flavor Fritos? <laughs> um, you're back in America and you're like, oh, root beer. I haven't had root beer in years. I haven't not been raped at night for so long. That's it, Rish. Uh, Nigel yeah. just turned off the show. <laughs> So I think anybody can relate to this story. What I thought about, you mentioned the super flu a second ago, but uh, The Stand was one of the seminal books that I read by Stephen King. Yeah, And me too. That's there's this point about two thirds of the way through the book where all of the survivors, the surviving main characters, where all of the good surviving main characters <laughs> have gone to Boulder, Colorado, and they've made this community and tried to bring everything back f to the way it was before. And it's I think it's the high point of the whole book when finally they manage to get this power plant back online and suddenly Boulder has electricity again and you can have refrigerated food and you can, you know, have light at night. It's just this great, look what we have done, we're, we're, we're back uh -huh. moment. And King has said in interviews that he didn't know where the story was going. He's one of those writers. Mm -hmm. And when he got to that moment, he came to this realization that these people had learned nothing and that they deserved to all be brought down again. And 
when he realized the hubris of them all caring about electricity and thinking that that was a big deal. And let's put things back the way they were before, that they had lear- not learned their lesson and that things were going to have to end tragically for them. So he came up with a subplot about the town going kablooey. And that always really bothered me to hear that because there's, there's a palpable joy when that happens, when it's like, okay, we are on our way. The worst is behind us kind of thing. That sigh uh-huh. of relief that you can breathe when the power comes back on. And so just, just the very title of this story reminds me of that moment. Yeah, I couldn't disagree with him more. I mean, just the, the modern conveniences and all that, you know, all the crap that everybody has that people feel so entitled about – Okay, that that is irritating. You know, the the iPhone or the the (laughs) GPS that tells you turn right or, you know, Uh whatever it might be. But it's just electricity isn't one of those things. (laughs) You know, the power to be warm in the wintertime. I mean, that's not a luxury. That's that's a necessity, in my opinion. And, and, And so I just never really understood that. But, you know, he wrote a great book. Yeah. And who knows how things would have been different had he thought it through had he done a darn outline at the very beginning <laughs> I, re- I really love the post-apocalyptic science fiction post-apocalyptic fantasy which i guess there's some and uh, what about this which is post post apocalyptic this would be double post yes <laughs> uh, and, and i like that too just so often and I, I probably complained about this before and you've cut it out but so often science fiction especially the mainstream science fiction that they play on escape pod it's just so negative about uh-huh. what the world is going to and how nasty people are and all that stuff. Oh, wait, O.T., can you cut that out, please? Thank you. I'd forgotten it. It startled <laughs> me when he spoke there because I'm just used to the farting and beeping coming from over there. So now, yeah. But so often, it's like human beings are just assholes. We are parasites. You know, we destroy our planet and we're going to move to other planets and destroy them and screw each other over and murder and rape. Just every once in a while, I like to read something where they say, you know, I understand that there are some people like that, but there are also good people that would protect the weak, that would pull up the people who are stumbling and say, come on, I got your back. Let's go. You can make it. And we had talked about the writer, and I'm sure you can remember his name, who, who's a champion of positive science fiction. All right. Uh, that was Jason Stoddard, I think, was his thing. And, and I'm not saying that we won't run stories about, oh, people are bad even in the year 3000. Uh-huh. But it's just... Because that's some, true, too. It's something that my mom would always say, you know, when I went off to college, when I went to prison. And she would always tell me that no matter where you go, you will find good people. Uh, you know, it's a sort of optimistic credence credo clearwater it's a revival that she would always invoke she came here as an immigrant from mexico Uh and uh, she found a friendly person that helped her family legally come uh, over the border even though they didn't know the family and then took them in 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 arizona you know just everywhere she would go she said she would find people that just welcomed her with open arms and says oh here have some of mine and 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 people like that and she was just sure that there is good in every town in every city in every block not just in america but you know in in other countries as well and i guess that's probably the case because there are just so many people and we haven't blown ourselves up yet so there have to be good people in in all corners of life uh all walks of life that's what people say but I just just the idea that uh, we came really close to going out, whatever the situation was in this story, whether it was the super flu or the rage virus or aliens or, or, or I, I don't know, maybe just terrible drought or the recession became a depression, became a holocaust, that there are some people that were strong enough to just soldier through it and then help everybody else get back be alive again and 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 i wonder if this happened to us would you go back would things go back to the way they were or would everybody who made it through be so changed that life would forever be different i think it would forever be different at least in many ways i don't know i'm sure people would still want to have cheetos again stuff like that mountain dew D &D games yeah these are the Oh, I, I realized what you did there. <laughs> Your buddy, Dean Wesley Smith, referred to people that grew up 
in the 80s and 90s as the entitlement generation in something I read just yesterday. Oh, yeah. And I've complained about that a lot, which is the kids today, they, they, they feel so entitled that, you know, they deserve everything. But the fact that I grew up in the 80s means that I'm among them and hmm. I too am entitled and, and I don't know what true poverty is or true hard work is or the hopelessness. I mean, obviously, every morning when I wake up, it's a struggle to get out of bed because what do I have to look forward to? But utter, thick, brown hopelessness, <laughs> that is alien to me. And uh -huh. I know I'm not strong enough to be able to survive something like that. You're used to like the that. runny kind of hopelessness. <laughs> Sorry to hear about your ass. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, the you hopelessness know, that I look forward to every single day and every right. weekend is sort of a greenish tinge. Oh. There's a little bit of yellow in and it's there. It's not so thick. It's more runny like that. It's kind of like jello when it's not quite done. I see. Where's but it does have chunks of fruit in it, though. You are. <laughs> the Parsec nominated Dune Steve team, folks. You have no idea. <laughs> you know, it's funny that, oh, that whole thing because my wife – she has mentioned that, you know, she's run into this at her job where, A, she works in retail. She's kind of working as a manager in retail. And the folks that are in retail are generally the people. They're not the college graduates. They're the people that, uh, you know, never put in the work to get a college degree. And therefore, they are less trained, I guess, in doing work and that kind of thing. But the people that she gets to work, she just pulls her hair out trying to get these people just to do the basic things that you would do if you had a job, just to show up to work every day when you're scheduled, uh, show up at least somewhere near the time that you're supposed to show up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And she was saying that somebody had told her that Generation X was the last generation that knew how to work hard. I don't know if that's true or not. Where Where's the cutoff between X and Y? I'm not sure. I think that X was if you were born between 1960 and 1980 or oh, okay. so, somewhere around there. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what the deal is with that. I, I always used to think Generation X was the young, hip people, but apparently that's not the case anymore. I'm old and unhip now. That is something in, in as each generation goes, it gets, I think, more and more that way. Like you said, Dean Wesley Smith said it was people who grew up in the 80s and 90s. And it was probably because he grew up earlier than that. And he looks at those people that are younger than him thinking, oh, these people are so entitled to everything. And they just think that they should get it without having to try. And then there's us who grew up in the 80s and 90s. And we're like, oh, these people that are younger than us, they just think that everything should be given to them. And I think part of it is just that we're getting old and crotchety. And Dean Wesley Smith is probably older and crotchetier. And uh, the younger folks... You know, there used to be that whole thing of in the 90s about how there were so many people that were just slackers. Shape up, man. You're a slacker. You know, they had that whole slacker culture, and then they made a movie called Slacker that was all about people that were slackers. Do you want to be a slacker for the rest of your life? And then all of a sudden, and there was Google and the other internet startup type companies that were made, you know, started by these slackers that everybody said, oh, these people are worthless. All they do is sit in their mom's basement and surf the internet. And then all of a sudden, they've turned these things into money making deals. And these people aren't considered slackers anymore. Now they're 45 years old and they're the kings of business. And I assume that most likely the same kind of thing is going to happen with this generation that we think of as entitled, lazy, worthless, complaining type folks are going to turn that around, I would guess, once they finally grow up. And maybe we just have to be older to grow up these days since uh, there's less hardships to go through or something. We think of having a layover that lasts for an hour as being a hardship. Hey, Big, why don't you share with our remaining listener... What Louis C.K. said about uh, feeling entitled. To oh, yeah. Louis C.K. is a comedian, if you have never heard of him before. I think somebody posted a link to that on Facebook that, that I came across. But there was this great bit where he was on the uh, Conan O'Brien show. Late great. Late, yeah. Oh, you were going to say it too, right? I was going to say late night, but no, it wasn't oh. even late night at that time. I think it was the actual Tonight Show. 
But yeah, he was on there as, as Conan's guest, and, and I'm sure it was a very prepared bit that he had set up for this, but he's talking about how everything is wonderful and no one is happy. And he, he went on to talk about how there's all these amazing things that we get to take part in. Being able to fly in an airplane, for example, you know, we can get in an airplane and we can fly all the way across the country in a matter of like four or five hours. And a hundred years ago, people were friggin' hitching wagons to oxen to go across the country. Or It the, took the rest of your life, I think I remember him <laughs> saying. At the very least, they were getting on some freaking ancient steam engine and going across the country on the railroad, and it took days. And yeah, there's just so many things, you know. And he, he got onto a plane once, and the stewardess announces that they had free Wi-Fi internet that you could use while on the plane. And they're all like, oh, wow, great, cool, you know. And so they're all excited and they start using their free Wi-Fi internet with their laptops and whatnot. And then something happens and the stewardess comes out. And she's like, I'm sorry to have to tell you that there's a problem with the Wi-Fi internet and it's not working right now. And uh, some kid next to him is just like, this bullshit. And Louis C.K. is just like, man... This guy is already pissed off. He's already and feels entitled to this thing that he didn't even know existed five minutes ago. I don't know. that Maybe that's the way the world is going. Maybe not. Maybe it's just Americans that are that way. I don't know. So what did you think of the story? We, we've talked a little bit about that we don't know what happened, whether it was a super flu or a nuclear holocaust or a... Rage-infested monkeys. Rage-infested There could be that. We don't know what's brought the society to the end and brought on the hard years. What did you think of that? Do you think that that worked? I think in a story like this, it was fine. And I have read stories before. I was telling you about Cormac McCarthy's uh, The Road when we were on the road, when we were driving. Is that irony? See, I don't ever... Hmm. I can understand if somebody somewhere says, Hey, that's not fair, man. You didn't tell us what happened. You, you just left it to our imagination? My, my imagination sucks. I, mean, I grew up on MTV. But for me, it was fine. It wasn't necessarily what the story was about. The, 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 re the story was just about rebuilding right. and putting things behind you. And, and is it possible to just forget? Uh -huh. Just forgive to, to move on? And, you know, that's, again, a question that I guess everybody has to answer for themselves. Just one of those, what would I do? scenarios but uh clearly for these characters they were able to forget to put it past them and move on and not be destroyed by the hard years how about you does it bother you that you don't know what happened during that time not at all i think it's, it's definitely the way that this story should be sometimes people will say that about a story they'll read a story and they'll be like oh but you didn't tell me about this i needed to know about this or that but that's not the story that that particular author is trying to tell. They're there to tell you a certain story. And just because you had an idea that maybe the story could go another way doesn't mean that the story that that author told is wrong or bad because you came up with some other way to do it. I think what it means is you need to go and write the story that you came up with and quit complaining about somebody else's story and saying it didn't go the way you wanted it to. Because, you know, if it goes the way you wanted it to, it's probably not very good. Not that your imagination isn't good or something, but if it goes the way you expect it to go, then what's the point of telling the story in the first place? If it's just the same old, same old, it's another regurgitation of something you've heard before, probably. So, you know, it's much better if it goes its own way and does its own thing, rather than doing what you want it to do or expect it to do. Okay, well, I guess you and I are sort of on the same page then, as far as this story goes. There is room for the story of how society falls. Uh -huh. and there's room for a massive work, uh, like Swan Song by Robert McCammon or, or King's The Stand, where you can just deal with how it starts, what happens during, and then what happens afterward. And then there's room for stories like I Am Legend, that are just the middle, the midst of it, you never get out. And then here's... One that's just all the way the tail end getting out of the storm. And uh, obviously there is room for all of those kind of things. There, there are many colors in the Homo Rainbow. <laughs> all right. That's good to know. How many colors? Six. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that as, as far as this story goes, that's what he chose to write about. 
and uh, it, it did leave me curious, but it didn't by any means ruin the story for me uh -huh. that we don't know. Okay. So and I guess that means we've run to the end of our episode, or is there anything else you wanted to discuss? Something that we've been doing that I don't know that we've mentioned on the show is that you and I have a blog, oh, right. a Dune Steve blog, and we try and do our own little sub podcast uh -huh. on there where we just rant or where we talk about something that made us angry. And, and that's called That Gets My Goat. <laughs> and I try and put it up every Friday. But if the listener doesn't know about that, because it's not on the feed, the iTunes feed or anything That's right. Like it's that. just how, a, it's how... a blog extra. It's just something that you can only get from the blog. So you go to the Dune Steve blog, and there's a button on the main Dune Steve site that will take you to the Dune Steve blog. And you can head over there and take a look at that. Rish puts it up so you can listen to it right from your computer if you do your podcast that way. Or you can also download it. And, uh, yeah, you can uh, take it with you and have your goat gotten elsewhere. Yeah, if you're one of those people that likes to listen to us banter after the story, then maybe it's for you because it's just banter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's no story involved in these other than us just telling stories of things that get our goat. And I have a, a lot of fun doing it. And so uh, as long as we can come up with things that anger us, we will continue to do so. And I think we'll put other stuff up there in the future. Maybe we could still call the subcast Gets My Goat, even if it's not about getting my goat. Yeah, I think so. I think that two people that actually listen to it <laughs> probably are used to it by now. Well, we did a, a game of... Uh, Two Truths and a Lie recently, and, and instead of just putting the whole game on the end of an episode, I figured we would put that in uh, the blog. Right, yeah, we could put that in as something you can listen to so you can find out the answers. Which were the truths and which were the lies, and were you right or wrong? Yeah, so check that out. It's www.dunesteef.blogspot.com. Right. Thanks. So, And also, thank you, Eric, for sharing this story with us, and... Uh, I hope you dug it. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. Uh, hopefully it's still September. <laughs> but October is upon us. And every year when October comes around, we at the Dune Steve like to do a little event that's called the October Scary Story Event. And so it's now time for, holy crap, the third annual Dune Steve Dune October Scary Story Event. Explain to the Ex lovely folks at home what that means, Rish. My, they are looking lovely today, especially you, ma'am. Pitiful. I used to do a little thing with my friend where we would challenge each other to write a scary story every October, and it was due on Halloween Day. And uh, we parlayed that into the podcast, and you have the month of October, or pretty much from when you hear us issue this challenge... To write a scary story, long or short, and then submit it to us. Usually we say November 1st, November 2nd is the deadline. Yeah, Just we'd rather you proofread it, remove the errors out of the text before you send it. So it's okay to be a day or two after uh, October is over that you send it out. But when you send that to us, send it to submissions at dunesteef.com. And just put in the subject line that it's October Scary Story, or OSSE, as Big and I like to call it. Actually, I don't know that we like to call it that. We just, it's just easier, habit. yeah. It's shorter that way. And we'll uh, choose a winner and uh, produce that story. And speaking of that, the Broken Mirror Story event <laughs> is coming to a close here soon. These stories have been read and graded. And within a short while after October, because we always try and stick with just scary stories during that month so that people can get a good feel for the season. But after that, we will uh, get into the Broken Mirrors stories as well, the winners from that event. And we will be putting those stories up as episodes of the show. Yeah, that should be fun. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening all the way through. And have a wonderful day. At the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine, we pay our authors. So if you love good fiction and want to see it continue, please donate. Keep on keeping on. Yeah, and all that rubbish. Is that rubbish, really? The Dune Steve is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. 
This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Old and dull gray metal. A stumpy butt. You're a stumpy butt. You are. Hi. Welcome. Welcome, yes. Let's see, I don't know how to start. I've always started with Welcome to the Dune Steve. This is the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. All right. Oh, and then I say I'm Rich Outfield. Oh, is that? We're I guess. all out just, of order. Oh, my gosh. Just started. Totally this is our very it. first episode. We'll tell you a little bit about ourselves and what you can expect in the future from this new podcast. Ah. Today we have a story. That's what you can expect from today's podcast. What is that story, Big Anklevich? Well, oh, let me we tell have, you. Should we have had the asshole robot get a chance to introduce itself? or? We have a story today. That's what you can look forward to. And what is that story, Big Anklevich? <laughs> and what is that story, Wait, Big Anklevich? I think you were talking when I said that. The story is called After We Got Back the Lights. Who would we like to thank this week? Obviously, Roger Superana. No author's note. <laughs> yeah, we never had one without an author's note. No, we haven't. Yeah, in 83 episodes so far. Although, maybe we can have Optimus Prime come and say, Hey, boys, stop, stop these, these damned, damned author's notes. They suck. I, not only do they not suck, other podcasts are doing it now. <laughs> and you hear Alistair Stewart say, we talked to Michael about the writing of this story, and he said, I like having sex with many strange women. All and right. I promise you it's true. <laughs> After that, a canvas... After that, a canvas back olive drabber growled its way right through... Right through. After that, a canvas back... After that, a canvas back olive drabber growled its way right through up 29, which is Main Street in which is Main Street inside the town's limits. The big army truck went north toward I think you still started a little bit. Just start okay. from, from uh, up 29, which is up 29, which is Main Street inside the town's limits. A big the big army truck went north toward Calistoga. Maybe I was just surprised at how... Maybe I was just surprised at... Maybe I was surprised at just how decent or how capable or how willing to dig in and do work that... Maybe I was surprised at just how decent or how capable or how willing to dig in and do what work needed doing. They were. I was asked questions along with everyone else, cautious of the inquiry inquiries. Cautious of the inquiries, I was silently waiting on. Hmm. Cautious of the inquiries, I was. <laughs> that sounds really bad. Does it sound bad to you, or is it just me being self-conscious? Inquiries. Somebody put an iota of thought into that. Somebody put an iota of thought into that descriptive of patriotism. Somebody put an iota of thought into that descriptive and patriotism, inducing... Oh, that's not a dash that is a dash. That's a... Okay, one more time, I'll get this right. Somebody put an iota of thought into that descriptive and patriot... Damn. Take a breath after you descriptive. I think you'll be all right. Somebody put an iota of thought into that descriptive and patriotism-inducing code name. One more time. Wineries can grow more than grapes, which we found out early on, laying in every comestible crop we could. I'm looking for some cheesy comestibles. The sort of hail... The sort of hail we'd all give each other at morning... The sort of ha The sort of hail we'd all give each other at a morning sales meeting at a car... Sure. 
The sort of hail we'd all give each other. Uh. <sighs> uh. It, uh. Event. Are you masturbating over there? Is that what that gesture is? Oh, believe me, you'll know when... <laughs>